Good afternoon, Club 17. Welcome. It's good to be back together again. Got a great group here at the Hilton, and we've got a lot of folks on Zoom. Welcome to all. We have a very interesting program, and before we get into that, we're going to start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And now Molly Rydell is going to lead us in the invocation and four-way test. Good morning, Club 17. Afternoon, I guess I should say. Please join me in prayer. Almighty Father, thank you for all the gifts that you have given us. We're filled with gratitude for our many blessings. Thank you for sending our speaker our way today, Mr. Eric Kearney, who has championed so many important causes in efforts to assist those that are underserved. Please continue to guide us as we always strive to help others in our community and around the world. Grant us wisdom, charity, and love for all humankind. May your blessings rest upon all of us, Almighty Father, as we seek to serve in your name. Amen. And now let's recite the four-way test of the things we think, say, and do. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Thank you. Including me in the prayer. That was very kind of you. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. And now we have a special announcement from Carl Kappas, the president of our foundation. Carl, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, President Brett. Well, it's with a lot of excitement that I can announce to you that the Rotary Foundation of Cincinnati is closed on a piece of property adjacent to the site of Camp and on, alongside Camp Allen. It's a process that began two years ago. Uh, need was seen to keep our Camp Allen from being compromised by development surrounding the camp. And an opportunity presented itself for us to buy an adjacent piece of property as a buffer between the current Camp Allen and future subdivision development. As you can see right here, the red, this is the existing Camp Allen with the, uh, all the buildings, the pool, the lakes, and this in the yellow is this adjacent piece of property. And this acts as a buffer because this subdivision is going to expand this way. This is a subdivision here and this piece of property right here also just became, uh, is gonna be part of a subdivision, and they would have had the opportunity to extend that subdivision all the way down into here, which is right next to Camp Allen. This property here across of Melia Olive Branch Road is now under consideration for a subdivision also. So you can see the subdivision is closing in on our camp, and, um, this, is, this opportunity presented itself and the foundation was able to purchase this property uh, adjacent to Camp Allen. Uh, not only does this 55 acres of property act as a buffer, but it adds a beautiful tree-lined meadow. It's kind of hard to see, whoops, but it's all along here. And the Shaler Creek runs all the way down through the middle of it. There are two houses on the property. There's a house here and a house here a small barn and some, some small storage buildings. Um, all this, uh, and you can see that there's also wooded area back here, or excuse me, back here and along here, and then this is all field right now that could, that could be used for uh, activities as well. So it, not only does it act as this buffer, but it gives Stepping Stones and Camp Allen the opportunity to expand their recreation, leisure, and respite activities, uh, in addition to being this buffer to the surrounding development. 
Um, many thanks to all the trustees and past presidents, Susan Wilkinson, John Firemeyer, and uh, a lot of people that have worked on making this acquisition a success. And especially I need to thank Fred Fisher, Al Conscious, Tim Hershner, Linda Muth, and a very special thank you to Richard Lajeunesse for a huge amount of time and effort um, that was done to put this, this deal together. Um, when you think of a, a piece of property, it's easy. You just tell them how much you want, and you, you buy it, and you walk away. Well, this was anything but that. Lots of uh, almost weeping and gnashing of teeth as we tried to make this come together with uh, easements and uh, paperwork and redoing of paperwork and redoing of paperwork and redoing of paperwork. Uh, but it, it came together, and so lots of, lots of good help. Um, it's not lost on me either that this additional property here, when added together, makes Camp Allen now 100 acres of camp. And 100 acres happens to be on the year that Camp Allen, 2021, celebrates its 100th anniversary. I'm really looking forward to a chance when we can all get out there and enjoy this camp, see what it looks like, and have a big celebration for Camp Allen's 100th. Thank you. <laughs> Bob? Yeah, the, this is the entrance into Camp Allen. You come down Amelia Olive Branch and you drive in right here. Here's the parking lot, here's the, the pavilion, here's the swimming pool. If you, if you follow down this, this, there's a little road that runs right here to this point and gives you access back into here, but there's probably gonna be a, a small road that connects the camp here so that this will still be the entrance to Camp Allen and then it spreads out into here. And this whole area right here can be used for, for their activities and some of these buildings can be used for um, the, the staff and respite activities. So it, it, it really, uh, we got a bonus uh, with the buffer and really looking forward to being able to use it. Thank you. Well, Carl, you did a great job explaining that. You also did a really nice job thanking the people who put many, many hours into it. But I want to give you a special thanks, too, as the president of the foundation. So we've got some announcements today, and we're going to start with the birthdays. We have several this week, February 20th, before Ochery, uh, February 21st, Sid Alper Sedgwick, February 22nd, Janet Metzelar. Let's wish them all a happy birthday. Now, as you saw in E-Rays this week, the roster pickup party, which was a chance to get the new member roster as, as well as a sweet treat, uh, got canceled on Wednesday. It postponed. Uh, we'll announce when it's going to be. I have to tell you, if I look at the last two, two weeks in Cincinnati, I felt like I was back in New England where I grew up. Uh, so it was not the easiest week to get around town. But we will do that and we'll announce that at a different time. And you also saw an E-Raise this week, uh, some directions or information in terms of the officer and director election process. Our club is starting that process uh, to elect officers for the 2022 23 Rotary year, and one of the first steps is to form a nominating committee. Three of the people on the committee are defined by bylaws. That's the immediate past president to come this July, uh, as well as the current president and the president-elect. But there's four positions on the committee that are at large, and they're open to anybody in the club who's not currently serving on the board. So if you have an interest in being on the nominating committee, please contact uh, President nominee Steve King and do that by email. And uh, you'll see his contact information in this week's E-Raise, and, and we'll keep that in E-Raise for a good while. Uh, you have to contact Steve by May 1st if you want to be on the nominating committee or be considered for it. And then during the month of July, the nominating committee will meet 
to nominate a slate of director and officer candidates to be considered and voted upon by the board of directors. If you would like to nominate yourself or another Club 17 member to serve as a director or officer, then please send me an email. I'll be chairing the nominating committee. Uh, you'll see my email address in uh, E-Rays, and actually there's a nomination form that goes with it. So just click open the nomination form in E-Rays, complete it, uh, send it to me at my email address, or you can mail it to me at my home address, which is on the nominating form. You have to do that, if you're interested, uh, by July 2nd. So this is giving plenty of advance notice. And the other thing I'd like to say is, if you have an interest in serving on the board or as an officer, or if you know somebody that you think would be very good for that, but you have questions about the process, just call me on my cell phone or reach out to me via email. I'll be glad to answer any questions about the process. So we've got a great group of club members, a great group of directors and officers, and uh, a really good process that was put in place in this club about seven years ago. And now next week's meeting, just a heads up, we're very fortunate next week to have Kim Kern come and speak to us. Kim is the Managing Director and CEO of the Children's Theater of Cincinnati. And now I'd like to switch gears to today's program. We have Eric Kearney, the CEO of the African American Chamber of Commerce with us today. Eric has a career in law, business, and politics. As a state senator, Eric served as the Ohio Senate Minority Leader and has championed a number of causes, including adoption, children's health, small business development, and pension reform. Annually, he led a 175-mile walk from Cincinnati to Columbus to highlight an important children's health issue. In 2014, he walked the entire state of Ohio, starting at Lake Erie and ending at Cincinnati at the Ohio River. I doubt that too many people have done that before. <laughs> Eric passed a number of impactful bills when he was state senator to make February Black History Month in Ohio, to create an adoption loan program, to fight childhood obesity, establish Adoption Day in Ohio, reform Ohio's pension system, and create Ohio's Poet Laureate. On a national level, he was a member of President Barack Obama's National Finance Committee when he ran for U.S. Senate and then later for President. Eric has been a leader in Ohio's legal community and is a managing partner of Kearney & Kearney LPA. He is an adjunct professor at the University of Dayton School of Law and the University of Cincinnati College of Law. He was one of the first African Americans to become a partner in one of Cincinnati's major law firms. He is licensed to practice in Ohio and the United States District Court, as well as before the United States Supreme Court. He serves as special master trustee of the $20 million Fernald II Settlement Fund in the U.S. District Court. And in addition to politics and law, as though that weren't enough, Eric has been a leader in the business community. He founded and built one of the largest African-American-owned publishing companies, Sesh Communications, which publishes the Cincinnati Herald, the North Kentucky Herald, the Dayton Defender, and other publications. And at the African American Chamber of Commerce, he has increased the membership to the organization's largest level. He's established more programs than at any point in its history and has expanded its reach. He is on the board of Union Savings Bank, Arlington Memorial Gardens, the Cincinnati Art Museum, Ohio Citizens for the Arts, the Contemporary Arts Center, Mercy Health Foundation, the Stephen Wilder Foundation, the Health Collaborative, Go Vibrant, and the Andrew Jurgens Foundation. And that is a lot. <laughs> he has been recognized as Legislator of the Year by the Ohio State Medical Association, Business Couriers 40 Under 40, and Second Act, and has received the United Way of Greater Cincinnati's Joseph A. Hall Award for Promoting Diversity and the Distinguished Alumni Award from the University of Cincinnati College of Law. He enjoys fly fishing, squash, and running, and has completed eight marathons. Eric graduated from St. Xavier High School, earned a BA in English from Dartmouth College, 
He's married to Cincinnati City Council member Jan Michelle Lemon Kearney, who is a graduate of Dartmouth and the Harvard Law School. They have two children, Celeste, a Dartmouth College graduate who resides in New York City, and Asher. In 2004, the Kearney family was honored as the Black Family Reunion's Family of the Year. Please join me in welcoming Eric Kearney to the Rotary Club of Cincinnati. Thank you all very much for, for having me here today. Um, you know, when you, when you have those things read, it really sounds pretentious, doesn't it, in, in, in those types of introductions. So I feel a little bit embarrassed about it. Um, but I also want to say that um, I could have accomplished very little without help. And one person that's here today uh, really did me a, a big favor one time. We practiced law together, and I had a particular case in the, in the firm that was a, a very large case and had gotten uh, some publicity in some national media, but the client was a pain in the rear and I, on an epic scale. <laughs> and so uh, I was pers person, persona non grata inside the firm for continuing to take this particular case not only to trial, but then to take it to the U.S. Uh, Court of Appeals. And so uh, it was a lot of tension. We have monthly partner meetings and people are not really feeling me or this particular case, right? And so it comes the day where um, I have to present the argument in the, in the Court of Appeals. So typically you have a couple of people that go with you or you have a team that goes over. And so I was basically, I knew I was going to be by myself, right? I would have a folder with my remarks and I'd have, maybe I'd carry in a briefcase just to look cool, but basically I knew I was going to be by myself. And so this person said, you know, Kearney, I'll go with you. And it was Mike Schmidt. And Schmitty, that, w that meant the absolute world to me. It was one of the nicest things uh, you could have done to listen to that 15 minutes while I got slaughtered by the three-judge panel. But um, to this day, I, I remember how kind you were to, to have done that, to have taken the time to do that. So I'm really honored to, to be here today. And Brett, thank you very much for that um, introduction and, and um, you know, reading, reading all of that. I greatly, greatly appreciate it. I'm going to go through these slides fairly quickly. Some of them um, have already been covered through the introduction. I, di I didn't know I'd get such a great introduction. Okay, I'm hitting the green triangle, and then the green light is lighting up, but the slides aren't moving. Huh? Did I do something wrong? Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to cover, I've got a thesis for you, right? So this is like back in school. Um, I'm not going to cover my background because we've already done that. I'm going to talk about the local economy a little bit and about the African American Chamber of Commerce. And then I have homework for you. OK, I'm, what am I not doing? Right? It's lighting up the green. Oh, OK. So the first part is the greater Cincinnati area faces some unique challenges that must be addressed with new ideas approaches and attitudes from diverse and traditionally underrepresented voices interacting with and melding into our power structure. Oh, I, I, don't, I don't know why, but my, my belief is that many of society's <clears throat> ills or the concerns that we have can be addressed through entrepreneurship, through business. And, and I believe that if we invest in and support small business, and I want to be very clear about that, small businesses, particularly minority-owned businesses, we'll see increased employment of, amongst people who have not traditionally held jobs, we'll see better neighborhoods, we'll see better schools, increased housing values, and a higher quality of life. Eventually, my goal is that Cincinnati 
will be known for small business support, much as we're known and we're synonymous with the Reds, the Bengals, Grater's Ice Cream, Skyline, Gold Star, I don't want to get into an argument, CVG, and the Black Family Reunion. Um, Cincinnati's big employers, right? We're all familiar with them. These are internationally known names and uh, entities. And then uh, these are the largest employers. Some are in Northern Kentucky. I'm not excluding Northern Kentucky. And this is Cincinnati. Of course, you know, Kroger, Children's, uh, General Electric, Proctor, Saney's, Fifth Third, City of Cincinnati. And then I also included Dayton because more and more Cincinnati and Dayton are melding together. Um, and so you can see Wright, Pat, Premier, Montgomery County, Sinclair Community College, LexisNexis. Uh, and so the top industries, transportation, utilities, healthcare, education, professional services, government, <clears throat> and then if we can go to the next slide, uh, Northern Kentucky, bourbon, right? Uh, but no, that should be uh, beverage and entertainment, healthcare, chemicals, manufacturing, and logistics. Uh, and then Dayton, aerospace, as you would expect, health sciences, information technology, and advanced manufacturing. Uh, and then Westchester, which is becoming kind of the middle of our, our particular market, life sciences, healthcare, consumer marketing, and manufacturing. So remember those industries because later on I'm going to show you how uh, firms in the African American market are a little bit different. Then I want to talk about the population growth rate in, in this particular area. So Cincinnati's population is growing by 8.8%. The African American community is growing <clears throat> substantially as well as the Hispanic community. And our age uh, demographics are moving between 20 and, and 49 years old. Dayton's population is decreasing. The number one place that people from Dayton are moving are, uh, is, is Cincinnati. And then Ohio, as a state, we're flat, right? We're not growing at all. And the U.S. population as a whole is growing by 16.2%. And then the next slide gives you a, a representation about, you can see Cincinnati on the far left, Dayton and, and Ohio in the middle, and then the U.S. So that gives you a, a representation about how things are changing. Uh, okay, so now this is from the state of Ohio, the Department of Administrative Services. And what this talks about is, and it's written by an economist, but basically they're saying, we have a lot of slow growth industries in Ohio. We don't have many or enough fast growing industries compared to the nation. And what's really hurting us is the slow population growth. So due to persistent domestic out migration, folks moving out, that may be the most significant factor pointing to a slower overall economic growth in Ohio. Okay? So there are a number of organizations that are helping with increasing the, econ the economy, economic development organizations in, in Ohio. And, and I'm just focusing on Greater Cincinnati, Northern Kentucky. Okay, Ocean, and we can just go through these. Uh, Hillman, who, who's run by Candace, that's a minority and women-owned VC fund, uh, Mortar, which helps micro enterprises, uh, Cincy Tech, everybody's familiar with Cincy Tech, Queen City Angels, which uh, a couple of people in this room are members of, along with myself, the Brandery, that's well known, Main Street Ventures, which is doing great things, um, Centrifuge, that's very well known, Hamilton County Development Corp, uh, that's another economic development organization. Uh, 1819, the Innovation Center, which is really doing great things as well. And then uh, Triad, which is uh, over in Northern Kentucky. And then next one is my favorite one, the African American Chamber of Commerce, right? So we're celebrating our 25th anniversary. We're located on Gilbert Avenue, uh, about, what, a mile and a half, two miles from, from where we are right now. We have 120 programs, and we're the largest African-American chamber in the state of Ohio. People may not know this, but Cincinnati has the largest chamber, right? Cincinnati U.S. Regional Chamber, which I think is the sixth largest chamber in the United States. We have the largest black chamber in the state of Ohio. We have the largest Hispanic chamber in the state of Ohio. We have the largest Asian Indian chamber in the state of Ohio, and the largest Chinese chamber in the state of Ohio, which is pretty impressive. 
Um, and then we have an MBAC program where we serve 17 counties in Ohio. We get businesses certified. We provide bonding. Uh, we certify veteran-owned businesses, women-owned businesses, EDGE. We do counseling. Um, and we, this is our office in Piketon, Ohio, which is in Pike County in the middle of Appalachia. Now this is, I want to talk a little bit about this slide a, a little bit longer. This, these are the member demographics and they basically reflect the black business community in Cincinnati. So most are in business prof professional, construction is next, then finance and insurance. Think about, um, think about uh, insurance agents, things along those lines, counselors uh, in, in that regard. Um, advertising and media, and then restaurants uh, are, are next. Very low on the list, real estate. Think about how important um, re the real estate market is and how much wealth that has created. The technology is very low and health is very low. And, and if you compare the earlier slide, you'll notice Cincinnati does very well in terms of health, real estate, technology, but that is not shared with with typically black owned businesses. And the next slide. And then this slide just talks about membership type. <clears throat> and what I'd really like for you to concentrate on is the number of employees, the one to five, it's on the right hand side. 95% of black owned businesses in the United States, no matter where you go, are between one and five people. So that means if the owner gets the flu for a week, business revenues are shot, right? If there's a, it, typically they're a husband and wife team. So if something happens in that household, let's say a child gets sick, that, that impacts the business, right? Then if you go around, uh, I, I'd like for you to concentrate on the 51 to 100, there's, there's only 3%. There are very few. If I were to name some of the people, you, you would know all of the entrepreneurs that are, are in that category. OK, um, next slide. So now, <clears throat> we did a study where we engaged the University of Cincinnati um, Economic Center to do a study about the economic impact of black-owned businesses. And the reason that we did it is people talk a lot of stuff about, oh, we're going to help small business, oh, we're going to help black-owned businesses, but nobody had data. So we commissioned this study. We were, the first, we were the first in the country to do this, so Cincinnati is the only market. So if you ask me to compare it to another city, I can't do it because it hasn't been done. And, and this study uh, is, is very impactful. So if you would, could you click that little link right there and it's going to play a, what they call an animation.
It's first of its kind. It shows that there's $1.4 billion economic impact. Uh, the businesses employ almost 8,700 people, $540 million in earnings, $6.2 million in sales tax, and $1.2 million just in five counties, Brown, Butler, Claremont, Warren, and Hamilton. And um, it, it interviewed, they interviewed 800 businesses, which we believe is about um, a, th a third of the businesses. Um, but why I think this study still holds up is the majority of that of that of those other businesses are going to be one or two person operations, which typically have a hundred thousand dollars or one hundred fifty thousand dollars in in revenue. Um, so now, while we're very proud of that statistic, let's let's put it in a little bit of context of what we have. Black businesses are less than one percent of Cincinnati's gross domestic product, which is one hundred and fifty billion dollars. And nationally, black businesses are 2.2%. So we have a ways to go here in Cincinnati in order for those, those businesses to grow. Um, so you remember what I said at the beginning, my thesis, right? It was through entrepreneurship, support for small businesses, we'll see an increase employment, better neighborhoods, better schools, increased housing values, which increases um, people's net worth and a higher quality of life. And then the next slide, I talked about Cincinnati being some synonymous with, with small business support. So what if we were to say, um, we're gonna cut payroll taxes for small businesses with fewer than five employees for, for a certain period of time in order to spur job creation? And what if we were to say we're going to create economic development organizations that are based entirely on future growth industries? I know that Cincy Tech does that, but I mean, really break it down and make it, make it uh, hyper-focused. And what if we were to say that we're going to have an innovation corridor like we have with UC or third frontier dollars, which we, which we use, for small businesses with fewer than 25 employees? And what if we were to create a Buy Cincinnati program, giving preferences for local companies and incentivizing those purchases? And what if we were to invest, let's say, $30 million as a community in, in these businesses and see if, the, if we could double them in five years? What would that do for Cincinnati in terms of the types of uh, businesses that we have, the quality of life, the economic impact that we would have uh, by spending that $30 million, we could effectively uh, get $1.4 billion. Is that a pretty good investment in your mind? So these are just ideas, and they're questions that once you get data like, like we obtained from UC, could you say to policymakers, are these things are these viable things that we could do as a community? Now, maybe some of the ideas don't appeal to you or aren't, aren't worthy for whatever reason, but let's think creatively about how we're addressing this issue. So the next um, slide, this comes down to the homework. I know everybody's got their phones out to take a picture of the next slide, so they have homework. Uh, and I'm going to collect the homework in, in uh, next month, right? Right. So anyway, what my, my uh, plea to you is to seek out diverse relationships, personal and professional, and to make them last. So um, having interactions with people that are different than yourself uh, would, would be uh, wonderful and help Cincinnati to grow. And that is how business relationships are made, right? It's relationship-based. Uh, encourage a positive attitude because we undersell ourselves in Cincinnati a great deal. That's an Ohio thing I, I learned when I was in the Ohio Senate. If you, if you were to go to Eastern Ohio, they have the same attitude we have here. We always undersell ourselves and underappreciate ourselves. For, for some reason, it does not apply to Cleveland Brown fans, but everybody else it applies to. And then um, think about the thesis that, that I've, I've presented today about how we can improve and change Cincinnati. 
and act upon it in whatever way you, you deem appropriate. So the next slide, that's my name, and that's an old picture of me when I didn't have as much gray hair. Um, and that's my telephone number and my email if anybody wanted to talk to me. And then the next slide uh, is just saying great things are happening and great things will happen, ending on a positive note, if you will. Um, and I, I want to thank, uh, thank you, uh, the Rotary Club, and then uh, Doug Bolton, who invited me here or sent me an email. We were on some Zoom call together, and he said, would you come to would you come to Rotary? And so anything that Doug asks within reason, I'm, I'm willing to do nine times out of 10. So thank you all very, very much. Okay, I've, I've exceeded my time. So uh, we have time to take questions. Oh, oh, and that, that includes people who are on Zoom. And for the people on Zoom, just text your question to my phone, uh, the cell phone number which you have. And uh, Eric, if you'd be willing to repeat questions that come from the room, I, I will okay. stand up and use the mic for the ones that come by text. We Certainly. actually have a first question already. Oh, wow. Um, it's from Doug Bolton. Uh, he's not here? I okay. think he's on Zoom. Okay. Yeah. Uh, he said, yeah, now, now, that, now that you have the study, what's next? What concrete steps will you be taking to use it? So that's a great question uh, by Doug Bolton. Uh, so what we plan to do is uh, talk to people about it. We've had a couple of Zoom programs already uh, about it. And we're going to gather groups of people together and ask them what they believe we should do in Cincinnati. This is like a marker in the road. And hopefully two years from now, we'll, we'll do another study and we'll be able to compare and then hopefully other cities and other markets will copy what we did and they will do a study. And so uh, hopefully we've, we've set a train in motion that, that other people will join. So that's, that's what we're gonna do. And hopefully policymakers will look at the study, read the study, and, um, and act accordingly to help small business. Oh, yeah, go, go ahead, sir. Mm -hmm. that you have uh, this and, and reached out to other regions to get those studies done to increase the data. Okay, so the, the question is, uh, he imagines that we've reached out to other markets to do a study, a similar study like, like this one. Um, and to tell you, we have not. We, we, haven't, we haven't done that. I think the people at uh, UC Center for Economics are going to do that. Economic Center, I'm sorry, UC Economic Center are going to do that, but the African American Chamber, we have personally uh, have not done that. No, it's a good idea, I'm not, I'm not debating it, but we just haven't done it. Yes, sir. Thank you very much for your involvement in all your many endeavors and the leadership and the vision. Um, small business, small business creation and entrepreneurship takes vision. So the question was, how are schools, public schools, charter schools, uh, helping to impact small business and expose children to small businesses or entrepreneurship? Yeah, education. And education. Um, so that's obviously a very complex, very complex question, um, one which I am not qualified to answer. I know that Cincinnati Public Schools has 
the Rothenberg Academy, which is in over the Rhine, which has an entrepreneurship program. I, I know that uh, Princeton High School has a, a similar program. Um, and I, I'm, I'm confusing Mason and Sycamore. I think they also, they also have a program, or maybe it's Lakota. So one of those uh, three schools ha has uh, a program like that. I, I can say from the African American Chamber standpoint, we have not personally had any uh, interactions or programs with any of the public school districts in the greater Cincinnati area. Um, and further, we have had, um, we had, we've had some limited contact with a, a charter school called Don or Don, D-O-H-N, uh, with respect to entrepreneurship, but that has not traditionally been a focus of our programming. Uh, I think that there are other organizations that may may do that, um, but but we're not involved with that that aspect of education. I believe the gentleman in the back. Did you have a question on the second level? No. Oh, I thought you did. I'm sorry. I, I have two, if, uh, Ed, if I can get in front of you from uh, Zoom. Uh, they're actually both from Ariel Miller. Well, we'll just start with one. Were UC students involved in the study, and do you think this widened their appreciation for minority-owned business as an economic driver? Um, I'm, I'm not sure whether UC students were involved or not. I know that we dealt with two professionals, uh, Christopher N-I-C-A-K, and I forget how you pronounce that, and then Brad Evans uh, were the two professionals that we, that we dealt with, the two um, social scientists and statisticians that we dealt with, but I'm not sure whether UC students were involved. So the question is, is the African American Chamber doing anything to help uh, millennial businesses who are trying to scale their typically one or two person operations and how to make them, them grow further? It's pretty accurate. Um, okay, so w what I would say is we, we have programs in terms of uh, how, to, how to grow and how to scale. We have an accelerator. Um, the uh, Executive EBA, Executive Business Accelerator, and that accelerator is with Interrise, which is the country's number one small business accelerator. We bought the license for this part of the country in order to offer that to people. So it's, a, it's an intensive 26-week program that once you go through it, it's, it's, really, it's really quite remarkable what the folks at Interrise have done. But that, that would be one example. Another example is that we have programs that help uh, these entrepreneurs make the right connections. So a lot of times you'll have entrepreneurs who are very good at one or two skills. And they will <coughs> use those one or two skills in order to make their business grow. But then they realize as they're growing, you really need a whole host of skills. And so we help people make those connections and have those relationships in order to help them grow. And so we have a whole host of programs. We currently have 12 different ones that help along various parts of uh, business growth. So that's typically what we do. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Yes, President. Mm-hmm. Okay, so Mr. President, this is what, what we have. Uh, we had 800 businesses that participated, 
in the study. And typically, these were, these were the well-known elite companies, right, with big balance sheets, and uh, the majority of our members, which are kind of the middle of, of that sector, and we had some of the very small ones. So we didn't get every barber shop, for instance, right? That's a business, but that's not included in our study. Maybe next time we can get barber shops or beauticians. We had some, but not representing the whole, the whole thing. Uh, so that's one of our challenges. B but the um, researchers have confidence in their data because we got like 95, 99% of the bigger ones. We just didn't get the, the smaller ones, which should be included. I'm not, I'm not uh, saying that they aren't important. They are important, but they're just not of great size and wouldn't move that number a whole lot. The study was conducted uh, based upon data from 2020 and 2019. And so what happens is we give the researchers names, we get names from various different places, we did some advertising and people could self-select to be part of the study. They then bundle those names, those corporate names, and send them to the state of Ohio. The state of Ohio pulls the tax records from those companies and then sends them to the researchers, but they're blind. So the Williams Company and the Kearney Company may send their, their name up there, right? But it'll come back as just company A, company B. And there'll be no, they wouldn't know that what my revenue is, they wouldn't know what your revenue is, okay? And so um, that is, that's how the study was done and that is the, um, the basis of it and, and why we have confidence in the data. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We have another question from a member on Zoom, Deborah Schultz. What can you tell us about the impact and employment in African-American nonprofits in Cincinnati, included or not included in your study? It's another form of entrepreneurship. So um, nonprofits were in included, um, but only, only a few were, were included, right? Um, because uh, you, you can't really, well, I guess you could say, but there's certain nonprofits who, quote unquote, are targeting the African American community, but they aren't really owned, right? There's no shareholder. Well, there are no shareholders with a nonprofit corporation, right? Um, so, so they they um, they're not included in, in those in those terms. Now, with respect to employment numbers, um, I, they're not broken out in the study, so. Uh, what happens is you get an animation, which unfortunately we didn't get a chance to see, um, and you get a PowerPoint, which has a little bit more data, and then you have the study itself, which is like 100 pages, and it's got all the companies that participated in it, and all of those sorts of things. So I could look through that and, and give a more complete answer, but as I sit here right now, those, uh, I don't know what the employment numbers are broken out by nonprofits. Yes, sir. It's 107. He did, but it's 107. <laughs> Trust me, I know. So what you do is you, you walk up Montgomery Road. Montgomery Road, uh, State Route 3 and US 22. Well, it used to be what was called the 3C Highway. And if you walk up that, you will walk from, you know, you'll walk from here to Columbus, or um, you can't do it in reverse, really. But yeah, you can do it. We have another question from a member on Zoom uh, from uh, Mark Romito. He says, Eric, thanks for addressing us today. Could you expand on the Pike County office you mentioned and the work in Appalachia? Oh, sure. Um, so uh, the African American Chamber has two offices, one on, on Gilbert Avenue, as I mentioned earlier, and the other one is in beautiful Pike County. And so in Piketon, uh, we have a, a woman by the name of Marlene Fout, and Marlene helps counsel businesses out there. So she would do one-on-one -on -one counseling, she would help with bond work, she would help people do a business plan, whatever they, they might need. 
Um, and although the name of our organization is the African American Chamber of Commerce, people may think, oh, well, we only help African Americans. Well, that's not true, right? We have members who are not African American, and we help people who are not African American. So if you walk in off the street, no matter what your race, and you want help with your business plan, or you want to attend one of our marketing seminars, or whatever it might be, you're more than welcome to, right? We don't turn anyone away. Um, but out in Appalachia, Marlene covers, oh boy, probably about 10, 15, not 15, but 10, 12 counties out there. So she drives around and talks to people and goes to various events or used to go to events when pre-COVID. So, yep. Yeah. This is another question from Ariel Miller on Zoom. Curious if non-minority owned major real estate firms hire black or Hispanic realtors proportionate to the population here. Um, I, I don't know, I, I don't have an answer for that particular question. Um, so I, my understanding is the real estate industry is more kind of independent contractor oriented. Right. So I, I'm, I'm not sure, I don't have an answer. Okay. Let me just, and, yeah, I don't wanna make something up. Sure, and one, one last question, uh, another question from Doug Bolton. How has COVID impacted your chamber members uniquely from maybe the general business population. What's your view of their recovery? Okay, so that's a great question. Uh, COVID has, has been really tough on our businesses. And I don't know that it's necessarily um, different than any other small business category, but it has been, it's been very impactful. So what we did in response was we called every one of our members and asked how they were doing. We provided one-on-one -on -one counseling if they needed it or wanted it. We changed our programming to uh, Zoom and YouTube oriented so that uh, they could get the assistance or advice that they needed. We partnered with the Urban League, uh, Greater Cincinnati my, uh, micro, uh, micro Enterprise Incubator and uh, a couple of other company, uh, other uh, economic development organizations to have push grants where we gave out one thousand five thousand and ten thousand dollar grants to help uh, people we also connected them with the state of Ohio's uh, programs and we did technical assistance with PPP um, loans so that that's what we did now um, we have seen probably about 30% of our businesses go under during COVID. So that's, that's terrible, right? I don't know how else to put it, but that's a lot of companies that have gone under because of this uh, pandemic. My hope is that they'll recover and uh, reignite the entrepreneurial spirit, uh, but that's, that's what happened. Great. Well, thank you so much. Thank big, you. Big thank round you, of Rotary. applause. Thank you. Thank you. It was great presentation, great questions. And uh, I'll just go back to saying, I know that Columbus is a long way from Cincinnati, so I'll, I'll keep it shorter next time. Uh, really good, and uh, we really appreciate you coming and speaking today to our club. And in, in honor of you spending your time and giving your effort to us, we're making a donation in your honor to the Rotary International End Polio Now campaign, a campaign that's been going about 40 years. So thanks again, thank you. And just as you and the chamber are very concerned about opening opportunities for many people in this community, even in the larger, greater Cincinnati area, we as Rotarians are very concerned about opening opportunities for others. It's a key focus for us. As a matter of fact, that's our theme this year is that Rotary opens opportunities. And after the meeting, I'd like to give you a pin that symbolizes that. Thank you for your great work in this community.
And I just want to say a word of thanks to everybody who joined us today in person or on Zoom. Thanks for your participation. Thanks for the great questions. Just a reminder that our speaker next Thursday is Kim Kern, the Managing Director and CEO of the Children's Theater of Cincinnati. So please join us. And in the meantime, have a great weekend. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>